Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host Paul, aka Bro Katan, because I'm I'm your bro. And this episode, we have a lot to talk about. Episode three of The Mandalorian has some major tie-ins to the Clone Wars, and it's packed with Easter eggs from beginning to end. The entry picks up almost immediately after the events of the last one, with Mando and Kermit the Frog Lady traveling to Trask with the last of the latter's species. Here he comes face to face with Sasha Banks' character, whose true identity we discover is Koshka Reeves. When the trailer first dropped, many people thought it was Rosario Dawson playing Ahsoka. I thought that it could be Sabine Wren, but in the end, we discover that it's actually a Mandalorian warrior in league with Bo-Katan. We watch as the Razor drifts towards Trask, and this shot was actually used as the opening for the trailer for Season 2. Due to it being worse for wear, its atmospheric protection simply isn't there, and you may remember that something similar to this happened at the beginning of Revenge of the Sith. Trask is a Naboo-like location, covered almost completely in water, and because of this, the locals of it tend to be based around the element. This is why the frog lady wanted to journey here, as, like she said, it would be very hospitable for her family. After crash landing in the bay, Mando asks a local Mon Calamari mechanic to help fix the ship. The Mon Calamari are actually renowned for their ability to build ships, and ironically, they're also known as being very poor sailors. The amphibious species, however, can swim very well underwater, and even exist amongst it for long periods of time. Notable ones include Admiral Akbar, who I'm sure you know from the original trilogy, namely Return of the Jedi. Maybe he should have told Mando that it's a, a trap, eh? When he gets tricked. But, but he didn't, so I don't really like the guy. Now we also see a crane lift the ship out of the water that appears to have legs similar to an at, -AT. The place is absolutely filled with easter eggs, and not only does the frog lady get reunited with her husband, we also catch a glimpse at Sasha Banks' character, who it seems is spying on Mando. This explains how the group later arrived to save him from the backstabbing Quarren that promised to take him to some Mandalorians. I suppose they do take him to some in a way, and the Quarren are a species that come directly from the planet Dak, which is also the home of the Mon Calamari. Over the centuries, they've kept up a pretty tense relationship with the other indigenous species, but on Trask at the very least, it seems like they and the Mon Calamari get along. A small squid-like creature is given to Baby Yoda as food, and this also tries to suck his face off. I think this might be building upon the alien reference last week, with this thing becoming almost like a face hugger. Mando gets a ship with some Quarren sailors, but they end up ambushing him because they want the best guard armor he possesses. As we learned in the first episode of this season, this metal has become more and more scarce throughout the galaxy, and it's likely that they could live comfortably for the rest of their lives if they manage to attain it. They shove Baby Yoda into the feeding pit of a giant eel-like monster, and Mando dives in after the child. He becomes trapped and is only saved by the arrival of three Mandalorians, led by none other than Bo-Katan. This ties back to the title, The Heiress, and Bo is actually in line for the throne of Mandalore. Bo is played by Katie Sackhoff, who also voiced her in the show, and she looks incredible in the costume. Bo-Katan was originally a massive part of the Clone Wars series, and throughout she went head to head with several Imperial forces and Sith Lords. When it was revealed at the end of Season 1 that Moff Gideon had the Darksaber, many assumed that she had died, so I was so glad to see her back in this series. The Darksaber is basically the ceremonial weapon of Mandalore, and whoever wields it is seen as the leader of the Mandalorians. Before Gideon, Bo was the last person that we know wielded it, and many thought that she would part with her life before handing it over. It seems that the Moth managed to take it from her, and the episode is very much about her learning of his location in an attempt to get it back. The action scene of them arriving is incredible, and it was difficult not to completely fanboy over them showing up to save Mando's life. Now, a big point of contention in the show is that this group of Mandalorians remove their helmets. It's been hammered home throughout the series that Mandalorians should not do this, and it comes as a great surprise to Mando when they do. The whole helmet thing has been highly contested, and there has been a lot of back and forth in the Star Wars community over which way is right. Bo berates Mando for being part of the Watch, who are a cult of religious zealots that broke away from Mandalorian society as they sought to re-establish the ancient way. Thus, Mando is mocked a bit by the other Mandalorians, and now it turns out that, that there is two ways, eh? Now, I'm glad that they addressed that here, and who knows, 
going forward, Mando might actually start taking his helmet off a bit more because, hey, Pedro Pascal looks glorious, bro. Now, the male Mandalorian that is with them, I know his face, I just can't put my finger on who it is, and I've spent ages googling British actors to find out who's playing him. I couldn't, but if there's one thing I know, it's that my audience is much smarter than me, and one of you will write the guy's name in the comments below, and I'll be like, ah, it is, it is John Johnson. Anyway, they blow the ship, and Mando returns to the bay where he's ambushed by more Quarrens who want revenge for the attack. The Mandalorians arrive again and state that Trask is a black market planet that is dealing in weapons which they wish to take. Upon gaining these, they'll be able to reclaim Mandalore and return order to the planet. Mando kind of scoffs at this as he states that the Empire ravaged it to the point that it was inhospitable, but Bo says that this is propaganda that's used to divide them. Mando stays strong in his mission to return Baby Yoda to the Jedi, and they state they'll tell him where one is in exchange for helping out on their job. Mando leaves the child with the Frog family, which I, I wouldn't do, I just wouldn't do because I don't like how he's looking at that kid. He's a maniac. Anyway, cue a big action scene in which they storm an Imperial freighter, which is commanded by Titus Welliver. You may know him for playing the man in black in Lost, and I kind of wish that he got a bit more of a role as he's an awesome actor. You can also hear the alarm sound that was used on the Death Star, and the Elevator 2 takes the designs of one scene on that. The show really goes all out in the final 15 minutes, and it feels like one of the best action scenes in its history. I love how season 2 has really ramped up the action, and after I was left feeling a bit disappointed by last week's entry, I have to say, this easily won me back round. Mando and Co move through the ship one by one, wiping out the Imperial officers and stormtroopers, and they send a vast majority of them out through an airlock. The ship is forced to signal help from Moff Gideon, and he hasn't really got any words of encouragement for them. It was awesome seeing Giancarlo Esposito back, and as we know, he possesses the Darksaber. Bo-Katan has been hunting him in order to get it back, and I love how their rivalry is slowly being set up here. As we know, he's also after the child, and we will likely see Mando teaming up with Bo once more in order to stop the villain. The Moff sends the ship off on a kamikaze mission, and Mando almost has to do one of his own as he rushes stormtroopers with thermal detonators. Bo and Co manage to stop the ship from crashing, and Bo gets to confirm that Gideon has the Darksaber before the Imperial officer bites down on the Star Wars version of a cyanide capsule. Bo asks Mando to join them, but he rejects this and instead asks for information on the Jedi. This is where we learn of Ahsoka, who is in the city of Kaladin on the forest planet of Corvus. Ahsoka is of course a massive character in the Star Wars universe, and it's been long theorised that she would be appearing in the series at some point. With these directions, Mando picks up the child, the Frog family welcome their own child, and we end the episode with the Razor looking like a fishing boat. Now, before we get into what could be happening next, I just want to remind you that we do videos like this every day, so if you're enjoying it, then please subscribe to the channel. Don't forget we're also giving away 3 copies of the Marvel Phase 2 box set, and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below. The winners are going to be chosen on the 30th of November, so make sure you get involved. Now going forward, Mando is heading out to Ahsoka, but as we know from the series, nothing is ever straightforward, and when things are left on a cliffhanger, it can often be a long time before they're resolved. So who knows if we will actually get to see Ahsoka next episode, and that falling bit of metal left behind by the ship does tease to me that it's going to encounter some problems before they arrive at Corvus. Boba Fett is also still out there looking for Mando, and I would actually love to see the character appear in the next entry. However, if things go smoothly and we do meet Ahsoka, then she will likely fill us in with a lot of information. The Clone Wars ended with her fate unknown, and though she was in Rebels, there's very little that we actually have concrete about what's happened to her. She will likely be played by Rosario Dawson, and the Jedi Master will probably take the child under her wing and start to provide him with the Jedi training that he needs. Now this also leaves the door open for Darth Maul, who was a big rival of both Bo and Ahsoka. Ray Park was rumoured to be in the series, and I think it would be incredible if he popped up. Either way, there's a lot of directions that they can take it, and I really can't wait to see what happens. 
And obviously, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the episode, so make sure you comment below and let me know. If you enjoyed this video, then please drop a thumbs up and make sure you check out our breakdown of who Baby Yoda is, which will be linked at the end. We go over the best theories, so it's definitely worth checking out if you want to know more. If you want to support the channel and get to see content early, then please consider clicking the join button below. You can also come chat us on the Discord server linked in the description or heavy spoilers on Twitter. Thanks for making it until the end of the video. You've been the best. I've been Paul. I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.